18 to 20 years I've been doing Aurora research. It never gets boring watching the Aurora. It's, it's just a pure joy to watch. Anytime I look at the Aurora, I'm just curious about what's going on. Why is it doing exactly that? Why, why are the forms looking like that? Some of the motions you see, that's 100 kilometers, and that, that ray just went across that in about two seconds. I worry that I know enough about Aurora that I sort of lose the magic of it, but when you know the scope of what you're looking at, it's quite interesting. My name is Don Hampton, and I uh, research uh, the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis, to try to understand how this whole system affects our modern society. The work they did in the 50s through the 80s was understanding what is causing the aurora. You know, how well can we predict those? We're sort of shifting now into trying to understand how the aurora affects the upper atmosphere and communications and that sort of thing. We are more and more reliant on talking to satellites. We do transactions over the internet. We do communications between us and planes. We, we navigate using satellites, but the sun can actually produce large solar storms that create these very massive auroras that would mess up one of the satellites. The power grids can also be impacted. During one of those storms, you get currents in the ionosphere and that induces currents in those power systems that can heat up transformers and have them damaged as well. The sun is always putting out this stream of particles called the solar wind. Particles are moving a few million miles an hour. When that bumps into our magnetic field, they follow down magnetic field lines and they bump into molecules in our atmosphere. They depart energy from their motion into those uh, particles and they get excited. When they get excited, they actually let out a little bit of a light. And that light that you see from those molecules, that's the aurora. The magnitude of the aurora changes quite a bit based on the strength of the, of the solar wind, which, which changes from day to day and it changes over an 11 year cycle. So right now we're in what's called solar minimum. During solar maximum, on a given night, you're more likely to see aurora. So I, I study auroras here at, at Poker Flat Research Range. All across Alaska, we've got sites that have observatories and so we, we operate cameras and spectrographs at those sites as well. I am mostly interested in the optical phenomenon of Aurora, so I use uh, different sorts of cameras. What we tend to use are what are called EMCCD cameras, uh, electron multiplying CCDs that are very sensitive. These EMCCDs are not what you would normally use taking a nice picture or even a nice movie of the Aurora. We want to know every single detail of the Aurora that's coming through on that camera. And I'll take about 20,000 images a night on a winter night in uh, December and January. Because we are interested in the colors of the aurora, we use what are called spectrographs, which basically take the light of the aurora and spread it out, sort of like a prism. Most people, when they see aurora, they see a fairly bright green color. That is from atomic oxygen. If we have light from an atom molecule in the lower atmosphere, say the nitrogen, sort of this pinkish, reddish color, uh, that means that particles that created that aurora are more energetic. We've got uh, basically recipes for figuring out how energetic the particles were that came down and created it, and even how many particles are coming down you know, in, in a given area. Again, I primarily look at the optical portion of it, but uh, we combine that with the radar we have on range. Unlike camera, which can only look at the light that's coming down, we've got uh, radars that can look in the upper atmosphere and see how the aurora is changing the number of charged particles in the upper atmosphere. So the combination is really good because we can see what's happening at different altitudes. That's important because when you get aurora, you get uh, sort of a, a thin plasma in, in that same region, primarily made up of atomic oxygen and electrons, so they carry their own magnetic field and electric field and that plasma can actually sort of push against the winds in the upper atmosphere and then even reverse it in some other cases. So we're getting to the altitudes where you get lower orbiting satellites. And if you change the winds in certain directions or change the density, that actually changes what that satellite's going through. And it's enough that it can change the trajectory just a little bit by even a few kilometers over a few days. But each of those satellites is now something that has to avoid other satellites as well. As we're trying to understand how the aurora affects the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere and communications and that sort of thing, one of the big questions we're still trying to understand is what scale is the most important and how much does a small arc in the middle of a larger storm, how much does that matter in the overall scheme of things? Does, does this one arc that's only three kilometers across, is that going to affect the, the winds in the upper atmosphere and, and mess up one of the satellites or not? I, th I think we're learning pretty well to read the aurora. 
uh, there are still certain things we don't know about. I've, I've got a case from a couple of years ago where one night it started the forms that are what we would call the start of a substorm, but about 10 minutes later it just stopped. And, and I don't know why. So it, it's still those kind of questions. That's what science is, is, is you sit and look at patterns and start to try to tease out why it's doing that. It's just excitement to be able to say, well, maybe today we'll see the aurora that, that helps us sort of figure out why sometimes it starts there and sometimes it doesn't start at all.